Um, so my talk today is going to be about some of our group's ongoing work on developing computer vision methods uh, for trying to perform visual analysis of features in uh, cryo-ET data. Um, so uh, my group's focus in general is on machine learning and computer vision. Uh, and we work on many different types of uh, biomedical visual data in our group. Um, and so I just wanted to start by talking a little bit about why uh, in, in recent years we've um, started to gain interest in and in, in be particularly drawn to uh, cryo-ET um, as, a, as a really interesting form of data to work with. Um, so I think, you know, many of you here are probably very familiar with cryo-ET imaging and many of you much more so than, than I am. Um, but when my group uh, first learned about this type of data, um, and our introduction to it was through uh, Wa Chu, our uh, collaborator at, at Stanford, um, we were drawn to the fact that uh, cryo-ET really produces this sort of visual paradise of data. Um, and what you can see, for example, just even these examples here, are just rich visual scenes of many different types of organelles and cellular structure that are interacting with each other, um, some of which we know something about and some structures which we don't know much about. Uh, and then on top of that, all of this is also in 3D. And so we have this even uh, richer type of, of visual content. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think these sorts of large 3D tomograms, once we've collected this data, um, you know, so there's a lot of active work on then on now you know, subsequently trying to inspect it and trying to understand what are the sorts of features that are actually in this data. Uh, but this can be a, a very time consuming and, and challenging just through manual inspection. Um, and so I think this is where there's a really an, an interesting opportunity for uh, computer vision and, and essentially machine-based uh, analysis and interpretation. Um, and so I think, you know, in a lot of uh, computer vision work, a lot of the bread and butter is trying to reason about complex scenes, even in, in photographs and videos in, in very different domains. And in these cases, you often have people and objects interacting with each other. Um, and so here we have a very different set of, 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 of characters and features of interest in the data. Um, but I think there's this, this similar goal of trying to reason about all the components and interactions in complex visual scenes. Uh, but I think there's also uh, additional uh, interesting and significant challenges. Um, one of these being that in contrast to uh, many of the common domains in which uh, computer vision is applied, um, here we we don't typically have large label training data sets where it's very hard to, to get these. And so I think sort of label efficiency becomes very important. Uh, and then secondly, um, there's also uh, this notion of, you know, some of these features we do know something about, but there's also features in which we don't know much or anything about, and we would like to be able to um, discover and, 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 and study kind of uh, uh, either new features or subtypes of, of, of existing features and, and, and things like that. So there's a much less clearly defined uh, existing uh, uh, set of features. Um, and so uh, in that context, uh, our kind of overarching goal is to develop computer vision methods that can help support this type of automated and detailed and, and also quantitative analysis of diverse subcellular components in cryo-ET data. Um, and as I, as I alluded to before, right, these uh, cryo-ET tomograms, they are, they are, they are huge. Um, so we generate large amounts of data. Uh, tomograms can be uh, each one uh, many, you know, uh, thousands of voxels, for example, 4,000 by 4,000 by 1,000, um, each one being about uh, uh, 60 gigs. Um, and, and so, so we, well, we basically can have a lot of, a lot of data here. Um, and uh, these tomograms also contain many diverse types of subcellular organelles and macromolecules. Uh, and so that you know, is kind of that uh, diversity of what we may wish to uh, be able to pick up using computer vision. Um, and, and as I mentioned, there's, there's kind of a lot of this opportunity uh, because manual annotation of, of features in 3D uh, is, is quite time consuming. And so this can be a rate limiting step in how well we're able to, uh, to analyze and, and study um, different hypotheses and large amounts of data. Um, so uh, today I'd like to talk about some of our ongoing work in this direction. Uh, I'll start first by talking about one specific uh, um, K 
case in which we have developed computer vision methods to try to quantify and study mitochondrial granules in Huntington's disease neurons. Um, and then from there, um, I'll continue on to talking about some of our ongoing work on methods that uh, progressively try to uh, reduce the amount of supervision and uh, and labels required and, and how we can also um, leverage uh, other sources of data and, and priors when we're able to have them. Um, okay, so I'll start first uh, with this uh, with this this case of trying to st quantify mitochondrial granules in Huntington's disease neurons. Um, this is work uh, with my student Sanke Gupta as well as with our collaborators. Um, Wachu at Stanford and Leslie Thompson at UC Irvine. Um, and in fact, this project is uh, part of a larger collaboration where there's uh, many other investigators involved as well uh, across UC Irvine, Stanford, um, Slack at Stanford, uh, UC San Diego, and MIT. Um, and so, um, so this is a is, is is quite a large project, and I'll be talking about kind of one uh, specific aspect of it where uh, computer vision has been involved. Um, so, uh, so first of all, the goal of this work kind of broadly um, was to try to study uh, uh, ultrastructural differences between healthy neurons and neurons with varying degrees of Huntington's disease state um, with the, the goal of trying to identify early pathology biomarkers that could uh, later help inform potential diagnosis and treatment mechanisms. Um, and so, uh, so as I mentioned, there's, you know, kind of, uh, it's, this is a large project with many different components to it. Um, and so uh, first, uh, so some of the collaborators differentiated uh, neurons from human uh, iPSCs, in, induced pluripotent stem cells, um, and uh, they differentiated these uh, neurons uh, with, with uh, pathological and normal length poly Q tracts in the Huntington gene. Uh, and this is the genetic mutation that uh, causes Huntington's disease um, mutations in the Huntington gene. And so, uh, so these are referred to as Q repeats of different lengths, where a higher means more pathological. And so, um, so given these, uh, Wachu's group then identified uh, neurite regions of interest for cryo-ET imaging. Um, and here they did a lot of sophisticated work on growing and imaging the cells, um, to be able to uh, to obtain high quality tomograms, um, but the end result here is that they uh, were able to produce a data set on the order of hundreds of tomograms that could then be analyzed. Um, and so, uh, so they did a lot of um, of uh, you know manual inspection and identification of interesting uh, features, and um, a lot of this is also uh, described in the, the preprint that is cited uh, here. Um, but uh, what we focused on in our collaboration was one particular part where it was useful to develop computer vision uh, methods for analysis. And I think that this uh, can also serve as an, an initial example of what uh, computer vision can do. Um, so, um, so here you can see just uh, kind of their um, sort of identification of uh, useful uh, regions to, uh, to image and to analyze. Um, so here you can see uh, some of the tomograms that are produced, and this is just showing uh, 2D slices through them. Um, but uh, one thing that was kind of uh, initially identified just visually is that um, some of the tomograms, the mitochondrial in, in the HD uh, neurons that had higher uh, pathology, pathological state, uh, they tended to have these enlarged and uh, more abnormal looking granules um, you can see on the left here, Q53, uh, these granules that are highlighted in yellow uh, compared to Q18 on the right. So you can see that uh, they have these larger um, larger uh, appearance and, uh, and, and these are all located within the mitochondria that's outlined here in blue. Um, and so our, uh, our goal here was then to say, well, can we, um, can we, can we quantify and analyze this phenomenon over a large number of these tomograms and across these different uh, uh, Q repeat states and to see if do we have some sort of distinctive pattern across here? Um, is this also a consistent phenomenon that we're seeing? And can we see a little bit more about uh, the characterization of these granules? Um, and so our goal here was to uh, go from these uh, 3D tomograms that we have, um, like the one shown on the left, 
uh, going to a 3D segmentation of uh, both granules and mitochondria um, so that we could uh, characterize the granules within these. And so the goal is um, obtaining something like you see on the right here. Uh, and so in this case, um, what we did was to train a, a 3D segmentation model uh, to be able to segment these two uh, structures. Um, and we used in particular uh, our, uh, an approach that was based on uh, a, a semi-supervised uh, 3D segmentation model called a 3D UNET, um, which is it basically trained on a, uh, which we trained on a handful of partially annotated tomogram slices. So you can see here that given a tomogram, we take uh, 2D slices and just a, a handful of them. We, we looked at, uh, I think, annotated about 2% uh, of, of slices in the training set of tomograms. And then of those, um, we uh, can also um, basically uh, segment regions as well. Um, so here you can see an example of a, of a training label that's produced. Um, and that's this highlighted, uh, this mask region. Um, and so these were manually annotated. Uh, the 3D unit, uh, some of you may be familiar with, some of, uh, for those of you who aren't, I'll just kind of briefly summarize this here. Um, and so this is a, a, a deep learning convolutional neural network um, that operates over 3D data. Uh, and, and basically given uh, input 3D volume as, as input, um, we'll basically use st stacks of uh, convolutional layers at uh, operating at different resolutions. Um, and what you can see here is that you know, we've got this classic uh, U-shape, the left branch uh, going down um, this is uh, basically each layer, you can see several convolutional layers, and then we have uh, some max pooling, these red arrows going down to this kind of subsequent uh, um, sequences of layers, where every time you do a, a max pooling, it increases the receptive field. And so we are looking over a bigger region of the input volume. And so uh, once we get all the way down to the, the bottom of this U shape here, um, we have these high level semantic features that tell us a lot about uh, what's in the image. So, so those features at the bottom carry the information about kind of globally what is uh, in, in this input volume. So you can imagine that this is very similar to just um, traditional cl uh, classification models where we want to summarize what is in, in this uh, input volume and to kind of have some global understanding of what's here. Um, but this global understanding, uh, you know, doesn't give us this, the sort of pixel level annotation that we would like for segmentation, right, where we want to draw an outline, uh, the boundaries of, of what is a mitochondria or what is a granule. Um, and so that's where the, uh, the unit model has this um, second part of the pathway, which, which uh, goes back up. And here um, we use kind of these up convolutions, these, uh, which will do sort of in, in inverse uh, to, to what the pooling did. Uh, instead of downsampling, now we're essentially um, going to have an upsampling effect. And, and what that's going to do is to take the global information and to then um, expand this into uh, um, you know, pro progressively larger and larger volumes uh, until we can get the, the same sh you know, shape output as our input volume. And that is a, a pixel level um, labeling. And, uh, and the sort of important part of this unit is that as we're doing that, because we've compressed so much information uh, into this global representation at the bottom of the U, um, it it uh, no longer has kind of very very localized uh, spatial uh, details, and so that's where um, you can see these green arrows going across. That as we're uh, going back up and and, and upsampling to get to our uh, to our final uh, prediction output, um, we also um, at each basically resolution level we uh, concatenate. The, uh, the spatial features that we had obtained on the left side of the U, and you can see these concatenated in to the uh, blue features that are, um, that are being expanded. And so this allows us at every um, basically uh, level of this, of this unit model to combine together both global information from the, uh, from, from the entire volume, as well as the more localized features um, that were obtained kind of earlier in the uh, in the uh, model pathway. Um, okay, so this is the, the, the 3D unit model. And as I mentioned before, it can be trained in this um, semi-supervised manner where we apply a, a loss function basically 
uh, over just the pixels where we do have some manual labels. So the model uh, will generate a, a complete 3D volume, as you can see from the structure of these 3D convolutions, um, but we will train it using a loss function uh, over the regions where we have labels. Um, okay, so what we did was uh, was basically uh, uh, first use this 3D unit on uh, the uh, trained on the partially annotated slices that we have in our training data set, um, but uh, but just doing this is actually not not uh, quite good enough. It's it's um, gives us some signal, but the segmentations aren't as good as we would like. And so we actually use this two stage process uh, where we um, take the high confidence predictions that we get from the first uh, model that's trained. And, uh, and then, and then uh, basically the output, some of the regions are uh, relatively accurately segmented. Those are likely ones with higher confidence, but some are less accurately segmented and very often those have um, some sort of lower confidence. And so we take just the high confidence predictions and use these as pseudo labels to augment the training set. And so what we do is basically um, train uh, the unit again, um, uh, retrain it on this augmented data set uh, which contains both the true manual labels as well as the pseudo labels. And the pseudo labels may have some noise in them, but on the whole, uh, they should be you know, beneficial because they're pretty good. Um, they, they increase by a lot the amount of just training, uh, training labels that is seen during training. Um, and so, so that is able to compensate for, for um, some small degree of noise here. Uh, and so what you, you can see here is that this retrained 3D unit is able to produce segmentations uh, looking like this that is able to significantly uh, improve the segmentation quality um, over the, the second uh, panel here. And so again, these are all showing, um, uh, well, there's, there's showing uh, 3D segmentations. You can see the kind of the 3D volumetric segmentation, um, but we've overlaid this uh, just with one uh, 2D slice image being shown. Um, okay, so we did this uh, process for both the mitochondria as well as the granules. Um, and so at the end, what you can see here is that we are able to obtain um, a, a pretty accurate, uh, basically mitochondrial segmentation as well as uh, granule segmentation and all of this in 3D. Um, this that I'm going to play now is just showing uh, just a, a movie going through the uh, the 3D volume, and then as well as the annotations, sorry, the, the predictions and segmentations that are obtained. Right, so um, here I've just shown a portion of a tomogram that uh, was basically had one mitochondria in it, um, but this, this can be applied sort of just uh, broadly over um, uh, all of the data and all of the tomograms and to pick up uh, all the mitochondrial and, uh, mitochondria and granules that are detected. Um, okay, so uh, given this, we uh, applied the model over uh, all of the uh, all of the tomograms in the data set. And what this allows us to do is to get these types of quantifications and uh, statistics that uh, we you know are not able to obtain otherwise through just um, select uh, manual inspection. Um, and so you can see here uh, on the left, for example, plotting uh, granule volume. And so these are the, the sizes of the granules within the mitochondria. So basically we can take the um, filter all the granules for just what's, uh, what's in these mitochondria. Uh, and what you can see is that for samples that have higher Q repeats, and so you can see the, these labeled at, on the x-axis here, um, that uh, the granules become significantly enlarged in samples that have higher Q repeats, like uh, Q53, Q77, also Q66 compared to uh, Q18. Um, there's an interesting case where uh, Q109 is actually a bit smaller and, <clears throat> and then uh, subs subsequent follow-up uh, investigation shows that, that one potential reason why this seems to be the case is that, um, in fact, uh, a lot of the most abnormal mitochondrial and and uh, and and therefore granules um, have you know potentially just uh, uh, disintegrated, you know, deteriorated altogether, and so what's left is just um, this is such 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 a higher uh, state of pathology that what's left actually just um, looks a little bit more uh, normal. Um, but so we can see this kind of uh, this this 
this trend across uh, these samples with different Q repeats. Um, and then one thing that uh, we also analyzed was granules in mitochondria that had been treated with a PIAS-1 uh, knockdown drug. And so um, this is uh, this is basically a, a, a potential uh, uh, type of knockdown that could be used in, in downstream uh, treatments that could be developed. And so uh, what we can see here is that the granules uh, in the mitochondria that have been treated with this are significantly smaller compared to the control version uh, here of Q66. Um, and so this, this suggests that these sorts of reduced uh, PIAS-1 levels uh, might ameliorate disease and that um, therefore can be interesting for a future study. Um, and so this is what uh, we found in the, on the left side here. Uh, on the right, this is showing the uh, number of granules per unit of mitochondrial volume. And there's um, actually not much significance detected here across, uh, across these different samples. Um, and so what this suggests is that potentially uh, granules might grow by addition of, uh, of new material uh, to get that larger overall volume instead of coalescing together. Um, and so this, this kind of, of quantification is also uh, useful uh, to be able to provide additional um, insight and to, to guide uh, development of hypotheses. Um, and so this is one of our uh, just initial works on developing computer vision models uh, to perform automated analysis of, uh, of cryo data. Um, and so uh, some of the ongoing directions in which we're uh, continuing to uh, now turn towards looking at is, uh, well, first of all, um, extending to other potential uh, Huntington's disease biomarkers, such as um, aberrant uh, criste or uh, sheet-like aggregates in, in neurites and cell bodies. Um, we uh, are also interested in studying tomograms from uh, just um, more from other different phases of disease progression, um, extending this type of work to uh, other types of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and then and then finally as well from a, a, a lot of what I just mentioned were uh, different directions of biological inquiry that, that could be interesting. Uh, the last direction is also therefore improving uh, our methods to be more label efficient um, and in particular uh, developing unsupervised and improved semi-supervised uh, representation learning algorithms um, to uh, be able to uh, perform uh, sort of both more label efficient as well as a, a richer types of analysis. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, some of this, this kind of first study that we worked on. Uh, and I'll move now to describing some of our work in these directions of, of what I just mentioned of uh, going towards uh, requiring less and less labeled data to be able to perform and to develop some of these computer vision methods. Um, so, uh, so I'll start uh, first uh, just uh, again by sort of motivating why, why do we want to further reduce the annotation needs? Um, well, you know, semi-supervised computer vision models uh, like what we just discussed um, already have only a partial annotation requirement compared to fully labeled training examples. Uh, training, fully labeled training data sets. And so uh, these have already you know, uh, gotten us a lot of gain. And so we were actually able to train these models. Whereas if you required fully labeled data sets, this would have been potentially very uh, impractical. Um, but there's still, uh, there's still room for improvement. So you know, these types of segmentation annotations in particular are more expensive than classification annotations. You can see here that we do have to draw um, these sorts of boundaries. And so, uh, so you know, anything we can do to continue to re reduce the annotation need is valuable. Um, and then, you know, generating these uh, types of annotations also further can require some domain expertise. And so, it's not the type of thing you could just um, easily crowdsource anywhere, uh, which is um, something that's more commonly done uh, with other types of of computer vision data sets that have, let's say, a lot of just you know daily life photographs and images and things like that. Um, and then a, a second reason why um, we're actually interested in moving from semi-supervised towards uh, the extreme of even uh, unsupervised uh, methods is that these labels are sometimes also uh, in, in, impossible or undesirable to produce. And in particular, um, especially if we have applications of scientific discovery that we're interested in, uh, well, you don't always want to train models based on manual labels because you might just uh, reproduce some of the bias that's in these labels. 
Um, and, and, and so that could be something that's undesirable. And then for some types of uh, features or structures, uh, these labels might actually be uh, not very just even possible to produce just due to the limits of you know, what, we, what we currently know about these features. Um, and so as a result, uh, one thing we've been quite interested in is, is kind of uh, unsupervised learning methods for uh, segmentation. Um, and so this is something that's relatively uh, underexplored um, that, you know, I think, uh, I think there, there has been a, just uh, an increasing body of work on developing and leveraging semi-supervised learning um, as in our previous work, uh, but especially for, you know, 3D um, biomedical volumetric images, there's still relatively limited work on unsupervised learning. Um, and some of these types of methods are, you know, I think can, can have a shared methodology behind uh, whether it's 3D cryo ET imaging or other types of um, of, uh, of uh, biological or um, or clinical imaging, as as you can see here, um, it's also examples of uh, 3D MRI and CT and so on. Um, okay, so so this was a problem that we tackled, and uh, some of the motivation for our work uh, is that you know I think for, uh, first of all. Um, uh, one one thing that we were interested in pursuing was, can we use uh, self-supervised learning signals to make up some of the supervisory signal that would normally come from labels? And in particular, when we're trying to learn good representations um, that could distinguish different features within uh, within a cryo-ET volume. Um, and so we explored in particular uh, self-supervised signals that are based on the sort of inherently hierarchical structure of biomedical images. Um, and so, for example, with um, just cellular imaging data, uh, cells often some sort of hierarchy, uh, hierarchical structure where um, you know you might you have uh, organelles like mit mitochondria contained within cells, and within the mitochondria you might you have cristae, you might you have granules as well. Um, and so there's this type of uh, hierarchical structure here. Um, and so, uh, so 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 one thing that's been observed and uh, is that. Uh, learning hyperbolic representations can often be uh, useful uh, for um, for modeling these, these types of data for computer vision uh, applications, um, and uh, in, in particular, hyperbolic representations could aid, aid basically uh, learning representations for hierarchical structured data in general, um, and so so they might be a, a a natural fit here. And so this these are some of these uh, ideas that we decided to explore. Um, this is just showing this sort of inherent hierarchy across whether it's cellular structure or uh, other types of structure in, um, in an MRI image of a, of a brain, for example. Um, but we have many types of biomedical images with these types of uh, in, uh, inherent hierarchical structure. Um, so this is work uh, together with uh, uh, my students, Joy and Jeff, um, as well as collaborating uh, with uh, uh, with. Uh, Wa Chu, as well as uh, his uh, lab member Gong Her Wu, um, and so uh, so um, just to have a little bit of uh, background about just um, this notion of trying to learn hyperbolic representations. And so um, these are representations in hyperbolic space, uh, and hyperbolic space is uh, is is, um, you know, is a space that has this this negative curvature that uh, allows basically. Um, this uh, area to grow exponentially as you're getting farther from the uh, origin of, of some models. And so um, basically they're a very nice way to embed kind of tree-like structures. Um, and so for example, trees can embed into hyperbolic space with arbitrarily low error, but not Euclidean space. And so this is kind of a one type of natural data structure um, that is uh, well represented with uh, hyperbolic uh, representations, but it's also, as as you can imagine, a natural data structure for hierarchical data. So um, we don't have explicit trees in this case, but we do have this kind of implicit hierarchical structure. Uh, so in our work, we used in particular the uh, Poincaré ball model uh, for hyperbolic space, um, which uh, is basically um, uh, Base consisting of all points in in Rn of our embedding space that has a norm uh, less than one, um, and it looks uh, uh, kind of like this uh, illustration on the bottom here, where there, we have this distance function that can be defined on the Poincaré ball. Um, but what you can see in this space is that uh, basically each of these lines are um, uh, connect you know, points with, with, are, are basically representing the same distance here. Um, so you can see this kind of structure where uh, we're actually able to represent tree-like structures that expand 
um, because you can sort of fit in more and more distance as you get closer and closer to the edges uh, of uh, closer to, you know, the edges of this this ball here, um, uh, and and basically fit all of these this kind of tree-like structure in where you, you couldn't very easily with uh, Euclidean representations. And so that's kind of just an intuition, intuitive uh, just illustration of, of, of this hyperbolic uh, representation space here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I won't go into this sort of uh, um, uh, math behind this, but um, but we can, uh, there has been work that has, you know, brought basically linear algebra operations and so on to uh, the Poincaré ball. Um, and we, uh, in particular, what's relevant to us is we also have these mappings, uh, these, these equations that allow us to map from Euclidean space uh, to um, this Poincaré ball uh, representation and then back to Euclidean space again. And so um, given our image data and potentially some uh, operations we, we may wish to do in Euclidean space, this allows us to go kind of back and forth here. Um, so uh, hyperbolic representations, uh, these were um, uh, first uh, introduced, uh, well, some of the early work in machine learning uh, was particularly focused on natural language tasks, where here we have oftentimes explicit hierarchies uh, where the hierarchy is known here. And so you can see um, some of these uh, works that model, for example, subspecies of animals and things like that. Um, and then since then, they've also been used for a variety of other types of, of tasks. Um, and these are all particularly sort of deep learning, uh, uh, deep learning models using hyperbolic representations. Um, you can see on the left sort of very early image work trying to model um, organization of different uh, uh, digits. On the right, we also have um, different types of um, kind of uh, cellular, uh, 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 different cell types uh, that can also be modeled using these types of hy uh, hyperbolic structures. Um, and then uh, even more recently, there has started to be some emerging work looking at uh, different types of, uh, of, of image categories and, and structures as well. Um, so, so these hyperbolic representations uh, seem promising. Um, I'll mention just a little bit more uh, about uh, what I mentioned, which was self-supervised learning as well, um, where uh, we'd like to perform self-supervised learning with this type of hyperbolic representation space. So in self-supervised learning, um, we are you know, trying to generate these types of, of uh, supervision signals, often through pretext tasks, uh, that are tasks that are formed just from the structure of the data that we have and not not through any sort of external uh, or manual label. Um, and so, uh, so here you can see some examples of pretext tasks that have been uh, developed, um, whether they are you know, trying to take two image patches and look at their relative and try to predict their relative uh, relation to each other, um, whether it's masking out part of an image and trying to um, generate what's the masked out region in that image, whether it's a more recent forms of contrastive learning um, that also try to um, Look at uh, um, to 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 minimize distances between um, augmented versions of images compared to uh, unrelated images. Um, and all of these are different types of, of pretext tasks that uh, can be used in self-supervised learning. So, um, so what we did was we tried to, uh, to consider in particular this sort of implicit hierarchical structure that we have in these three D uh, visual data and to consider that as, um, as a way to formulate a type of pretext task. And so, um, you know, as, as, as we've seen, basically, um, if we look at subvolumes of three biomedical images, whether it's cryo-UT or we also looked at CT and uh, these other um, images with, with uh, 3D visual structure, um, there's often this sort of part-whole relationship here where, um, where uh, a, a volume uh, can be, is, is the parent of a, a sub-volume. And we can formulate a pretext task as wanting the representation of a sub-volume um, to be closer to a, uh, to a parent volume. They have shared semantic content uh, compared to uh, the distance with a more a far away or non-overlapping volume. And so we can use a, tri a triplet loss to achieve this. Um, and, then, and then because we, we don't have uh, explicit objects that we know about yet here within these volumes, um, we can try and perform the sampling at all different scales using different sorts of, uh, using different uh, sampling scheme. Um, and so this is kind of the uh, overall uh, structure of our model where given an input volume, um, we can first you know, sample different uh, 3D volumes, uh, sub volumes from this uh, larger volume. 
Um, and then, uh, and then we will use a variational autoencoder type of framework to um, basically uh, uh, perform the, the bulk of our modeling here, um, where you can see that uh, we've got a, a 3D convolutional encoder, so some 3D convolutional layers here, um, and this, we also have a 3D convolutional decoder. Um, and then the key here is that uh, we basically have our, our latent embedding representation. That's this, this feature re representation that will represent any particular 3D patch. Um, and that's going to be in um, hyperbolic space. And so, um, so here we can use those, the, the mappings that I mentioned before between Euclidean and hyperbolic space to uh, basically map into our, uh, to, to map basically output of our, uh, our feature representation into this um, hyperbolic space. Um, and uh, so, so now, um, given this, uh, we need to train our model. And so in particular, we train with both a, uh, just a, um, a variational autoencoder loss, um, but also with a, a self-supervised uh, hierarchical triplet loss. And so um, this uh, triplet loss is uh, basically modeling the relationship that I mentioned earlier, given these um, uh, sampled subvolumes. Uh, but it all takes place within this um, this uh, you know, hyperbolic Poincaré ball uh, representation. Um, so you can uh, you can uh, see uh, here that what we'd like is um, the triplet loss is a is a form of of of, of contrastive loss um, where we would like. Uh, basically, um, from an intuitive perspective, these anchors and positive ch children should be more in the same branch of the tree compared to one that's uh, very different. So you can see here that um, basically using the uh, Poincaré distances, um, we basically have a triplet loss where we want the distance with the uh, with the um, anchor and the positive uh, to be relatively uh, closer compared to with a, a negative. Um, Okay, and then finally, once we've done this to learn these representations, and again, this you know hyperbolic uh, representation space allows um, you know, this better uh, flexibility to to model the types of uh, structure that we have in this data. Then, given all these representations, we can uh, perform clustering to actually uh, group features together. Um, and so, what we can do is basically sample patches um, centered around uh, every voxel during inference, and then perform segmentation just by um, uh, by basically um, clustering all the representations of patches using hyperbolic k-means clustering, and then uh, and then basically all of the clusters correspond to uh, pixels belonging to the same segmented uh, class. Um, okay, so we uh, performed experimental validation here using uh, several types of data sets. Um, some synthetic data sets that were uh, kind of biologically inspired that we generated, as well as um, a MRI data set, and also we look at uh, uh, quite a few examples as well. Um, so you can see here that this is a this is a synthetic data set uh, that's kind of modeling the type of structure that we might see in cell imaging or in cryo imaging. Um, that this is these are slices through three D volumes, uh, and so uh, but the nice thing here is because it's synthetic, we actually have ground truth. So the top is the, the raw data that we generated. It's synthetic with structures, but we add noise to it. Um, and then the bottom is the ground truth segmentation. Uh, and so on here, uh, basically compared with prior uh, works, um, our, uh, our, our, our method is able to uh, you know, perform significantly better at segmentation accuracy across different levels of hierarchy. These are dice uh, scores at levels one, two, and at different, basically increasingly um, uh, Course level at level one, going to some of these um, small subcellular uh, uh, synthetic subcellular structures at level three, um, and these are able to perform well and actually rival uh, the performance of semi-supervised methods, even though we don't use uh, any labeled annotations here. Um, we also uh, added um, some d different types of, of distortions and even more noise to get the sort of irregular uh, biologically inspired data set, so that creates a more challenging scenario. Um, and then again, we're able to see sort of similar behavior here. Um, and then uh, I won't go too much into this, but also basically show the uh, utility of also hyperbolic representations in our model components compared to just uh, Euclidean representations. Um, uh, this is um, now kind of showing again on uh, the BRATS data set. And so this is an MRI imaging data set. Um, and uh, I think, again, quantitatively, um, you can see the, the usefulness of, of our approach improvements compared to, to previous work. 
um, and it's able to do uh, much better than previous unsupervised methods, um, similarly to a comparable range to some semi-supervised methods. Um, and you can see the upper bound of when you have fully labeled uh, training data at the very top. Um, and then on the right, you can see kind of examples of discovered uh, basically unsupervised segmentations with using two or three or four clusters. So you're able to cluster at different levels of granularity and basically um, uh, obtain these different uh, you know, uh, segmentations uh, that capture different levels of this uh, hierarchical structure here. Um, and then this is kind of one last example from uh, uh, CryoET, where here um, this is uh, again uh, showing 2D slices from uh, CryoET uh, tomograms. And uh, given the input on the left, um, this is actually uh, this um, same similar mitochondria and granules type of setup as we have earlier. Um, but uh, what you can see is that now using no labels at all, um, using this sort of hyperbolic uh, uh, formulation that we have here um, in, the, in the middle, you can see that we're actually um, you know, able to get realistic uh, candidates for structures like the granules and, and so on. Whereas um, if you use just on the right um, Euclidean representations, it doesn't uh, it struggles to give some of um, these useful segmentations we'd like to have. Um, so, um, so just to summarize here, uh, what we introduced was basically a self-supervised uh, objective um, that uh, tries to learn useful representations that uh, tries to that's based on trying to reconstruct this implicit hierarchy as a pretext task among subvolumes, um, and uh, and to better uh, represent this hierarchy, we also use hyperbolic representations, um, and kind of the combination of these allows us to get uh, improved unsupervised 3D segmentation on various types of biomedical images. Um, okay, so uh, just in the last part of my talk, I'll also briefly mention um, one other ongoing direction that we're exploring. And uh, that's trying to say, well, if we have, even if we have no label data in this current data set, uh, if we happen to have some uh, um, other data sets, which maybe are unrelated data sets, but have some notion of objects or features labeled, can we actually use those as priors to help uh, improve our a notion of what's an object in, or what's a, use, what's a distinct feature or repeating feature in the data set in our target data set of interest? Um, and so what this, this question really is, is a, is a problem of domain adaptation, uh, where we have a notion of features in, of objects or features in other data sets, and we'd like to transfer that notion to our data set. So uh, there's been works that have studied this question of domain adaptation, but these have usually bridged pretty small domain shifts. And so, um, you know, you might have cases like uh, two different types of, of, of cell imaging, each showing different, uh, each showing uh, nuclei, uh, but they don't look as different. You have some, some differences here, but they're not the difference between, let's say, um, cell imaging and uh, all different kinds of other subcellular structures or even bigger shifts between things like um, objects of um, you know, uh, pens and wheels and so on in, in, in daily objects with uh, cryo-ET organelles, subcellular organelles and things like that. Um, uh, but you know, I think at the end of the day, what a human might consider as a, as a feature or a labeled object um, does have some sort of shared structure across all of these sorts of domains. Right? What is a distinct object usually has some sort of cohesive shape or color or structure or texture. Um, and so the question is, can we uh, can we sort of transfer these, these priors um, in a data-driven way uh, from very different domains? Um, and uh, and so, yeah, so the idea is, is can we actually uh, perform this sort of transfer? Um, and so this is work uh, together with uh, my student Joy, as well as uh, Wa Chu. Um, and so we started by looking at this in the, in the 2D space, um, just to have an a, a easier time to start with. And, um, and so we looked at particular at the fact that there's actually very large label data sets um, like COCO, and for example, that have many just uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of images and annotations. And the question is, can all of these labeled um, objects in those data sets give us some type of useful prior to help us perform unsupervised instance segmentation in our biomedical images of interest. So um, our model is as follows, uh, basically given um, 
uh, input images from a source domain, and that's where we have labels. So let's say these Cocoa Daily Life images and a target domain. So these maybe our biomedical images. Um, what we can do is basically um, uh, try to, to transfer this notion by um, starting with, uh, we'll start with uh, the mask RCN architecture for image segmentation, which is a common uh, architecture that's used. Um, but we'll take the encoder of the mask RCN architecture and split it into two parts uh, with this with a domain separation module. And so the idea, um, actually, before I go into this, I'll just briefly give some background on mask RCN for those who aren't familiar. Um, this is a way to obtain, uh, uh, it's a model for obtaining instant segmentations. And so um, the idea is that uh, it extends the faster RCN object detection architecture. And so given an image's input, um, we'll have some CNN layers, uh, basically CNN backbone that produces um, a spatial feature map of outputs that's called the encoder. Uh, and then um, importantly, we have this region proposal network, which basically um, regresses to produce candidate bounding boxes. So these are bounding boxes of where there may be objects um, and uh, produces these from uh, just anger boxes at every location. So it kind of scans across the uh, the image and at each location kind of considers whether, whether there may be a bounding box of an object here and then we'll regress that. Um, and then for each of these bounding box uh, candidate locations, we'll crop the features within that box, essentially treat that as an, as an image and perform further refinement of bounding box as well as uh, a classification of what object is here. Um, so now if we want to perform this in se uh, segmentation, um, we basically can add a small mask network here that also operates on top of each of these regions uh, to predict uh, the pix actual pixels corresponding to the object. And so that's this uh, segmentation mask. Um, okay, so given these components, we can take that encoder portion of this and now split this uh, encoder to have um, basically both a common component that's shared between the source and the target uh, data. And this, we'd like it to learn to encode common notion of objectness and then we'll also have a private component, which is learning domain-specific features. So we give it some flexibility of encoding something that's domain-specific. So um, each of these are basically um, convolutional neural network layers. The green part is, uh, the, the shared part is gonna be shared. Um, it's the same layers, same weights that are used between source and target domain, and then the private parts are, are separate. So now given this, um, we will use some losses uh, to encourage in particular the uh, features that are output from the um, the green component, the shared component to have um, this, a similar uh, uh, distribution here. And then, and then on the other hand, we'll want these to be different between the shared part of uh, each uh, uh, feature output as well as uh, to be different between that and the private components. And we've got the similarity and difference uh, losses here that we'll train with. Um, so now given this, uh, this kind of encourages these feature representations to, um, uh, to have this type of structure, then uh, for the source data, we can feed this, um, these represent, uh, encoder outputs into a uh, region proposal network, as you saw before, and, um, and this mask, uh, mask network as well. And we have all the label data for the source, uh, source images, so we can just supervise this as usual. Now for the target domain, we don't have any labeled data. And so what we can do is um, still produce these region and mask predictions, but we can supervise this with us now a self-supervised loss that's based on um, a notion of a re representation consistency. And this is using a, a prior assumption that we have with a lot of biomedical image data types, including cryo-ET data, but it's this assumption that uh, basically um, we typically have relatively uh, homogeneous, uh, kind of, we have this notion of a background and we have features that are going to be um, with respect to this background. And so what we can do is basically uh, take the background, predicted background regions uh, within each, each bounding box and encourage to, that there to be some notion of consistency across these. Um, and so that's this, um, this background consistency self-supervised loss that we have here. Um, and then finally, uh, given that, uh, we, we start to get some, you know, this encourages some reasonable notion of uh, objectness already being transferred from the source to the, source to the target domain. Um, but in order to get kind of finer pixel level uh, um, outputs, we perform a second stage of augmented pseudo label um, where we take basically, um, again, kind of high confidence regions and use that as pixel level uh, supervision to, um, to, to fine tune the target branch. 
Um, and so given that, we end up with a instance segmentation architecture that does produce uh, mask level predictions, but all of this, uh, and, and this operates over the target domain. So for example, the cryo ET domain, but uh, with no labels on that domain. Um, so given this, uh, we basically um, ran uh, experiments to verify our method on uh, domain adaptation across um, several data sets from histopathology, fluorescence microscopy, cryo-ET, as well as uh, MRI imaging. Um, and so, uh, so this just shows uh, some of these uh, examples here where we've got uh, just the, um, in the target domain, input data, the ground truth labels and the prediction that's output by the model. And so you can see that it does actually learn to pick up um, useful features um, that, that you could then analyze. Um, and uh, let's see, and just in the interest of time, I won't go into really the, the details of this, um, but what you can see is that uh, our model is able to successfully uh, adapt from um, a, a relatively close domain. This is in the case of uh, of uh, fluorescence microscopy to, to histopathology, where we have some uh, smaller domain shifts. And so, um, so, so we're able to do a reasonable job of this adaptation, uh, but the bottom row shows that even if we adapt from very different um, daily life images like bicycle wheels and things like that, we're actually still able to get quite good performance. And so this large domain shift is kind of where the, the biggest um, uh, contribution uh, is here. Um, and uh, and then I think the the more interesting part is that uh, then on uh, data sets where we do not have small domain shift labels available, um, we can use this large domain shift method and still able to do well and basically to out uh, significantly outperform uh, uh, previous methods that had been only designed for small domain shifts. Um, and so um, so finally, just you know using this, we can start to apply it on data sets like our cryo ET images. Where here you can see, uh, this is now looking at just 2D slices because this is still 2D method here, um, that we can pick out these uh, candidate uh, regions of just features, some features of interest that we can then um, um, use. And so, so actually for analysis purposes, this type of approach is complementary to the you know, um, hyperbolic clustering uh, and representation learning that I mentioned earlier, where the, what this does, uh, so what the, what the hyperbolic um, uh, representation learning method does is, you know, it has to look at all kind of sub volumes over the entire image. It doesn't have this notion of candidate features or objects of interest. Here, we can obtain these sort of candidate uh, regions that we'd like to look at, and then we can use representation learning, like what we talked about before, to then group this into distinct classes that we may that are that are similar to each other, and that we can then uh, uh, provide a label to. Um, so, so these types of methods can work together. Uh, here, I'm still showing this still in 2D, and so um, our kind of next steps is to be able to then extend this to uh, to 3D data. And then once we have this in 3D data, and can potentially obtain kind of 3D um, uh, proposals of, of of interesting features or objects, then we can use representation learning to additionally perform uh, clustering. And so all this together is you can see sort of some of these ongoing directions towards um, being able to identify and analyze subcellular structures without uh, using almost any annotations in the uh, target domain. Um, okay, so uh, I'll stop there. And so um, and I think in our in my talk today, um, what I've talked about is first some of our, uh, our, our work on using semi-supervised methods to analyze specific um, subcellular uh, components of interest in Huntington's disease neurons um, and, and how we can use that to obtain uh, uh, quantitative insights and analysis that we wouldn't be able to with just manual inspection. Uh, and then uh, from there, I also talked about some of our ongoing work on now trying to push our methods further to uh, re reduce the amount of annotation that we need um, from semi-supervised to uh, an extreme, even uh, fully unsupervised segmentation, which has benefits both in terms of label efficiency, as well as being able to uh, target diff uh, diverse uh, range of features and, and structures for which we don't actually have label data or don't want to label data for. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. I'd like to thank all the members of my research group that drive a lot of the, the uh, work that I've talked about, um, and I'd also be happy to take any questions.